I was covering a protest in New York City. It started in Harlem. And I was on my bicycle following the protesters, uh, recording them and posting it online at the same time. The protest moved on to the West Side Highway, which is one of the two main thoroughfares, you know, major traffic thoroughfares in, in New York City and Manhattan. The police came. They arrested me as I was covering the protest. I told mm -hmm. them I was with the press. They said it didn't matter. And they put me in handcuffs and took me to jail. So I didn't mm -hmm. get a chance to finish covering the protest. This happened the same time when one of my colleagues from CNN, Omar Jimenez, was also arrested uh, mm -hmm. on air in Minneapolis while covering one of the George Floyd protests, mm -hmm. while his white colleague, uh, who was at the same protest, was not arrested mm -hmm. for doing the exact same thing. live on this is what i actually do at home folks i don't have like a team of people like doing this for me <laughs> See, er ernie's my team of people when we when i say talk to my people i should really say talk to my person that would be ernie right all right so and um uh we we can i don't mind if you if you want to keep talking right start talking right now and I, no it's and, fine go ahead we're we're yeah. we'll go live to facebook and we're chit-chatting and um We've got, um, you know, our own live thing here going. So I'll kind of introduce you while we're uh, doing this. Um, so this is In Conversation with Frank Schaefer, and I am a writer and commentator. And my guest today is Keith Boynkin. And it's a very special day for Keith and for us because this is the launch day, the actual publication day of his new book, why does everything have to be about race? And I don't know if this is the final cover or not. Keith, take a glance at this. That is the, well, that's very similar to the final cover. Okay, because this is the advanced copy sent to people like me who would do podcasts and reviewers and others. And I had um, the book with me a second ago. What did I do with it? Oh, it's out. I think I left it in the other room, but I have one well, over here. You got one handy? I do. Hold on a second. I'm going to move my microphone. You can see me in my shorts. <laughs> Good. You know, I, like I just said, I'm I'm wearing my raggedy old sweater here. So we we don't dress up for this. We all are in our houses. All right. Uh, hold, hold the real one up a second so we can just see the finished product here. Ta -da. Yeah, it's, very, it's very similar. There's mine. Yeah. There's yours. Yeah. But anyway, um, so Keith, I, I read this book very carefully. And in fact, I just want to show you here how dog. Oh my gosh, you got notes. Yes. That's where I, I used to notes. That's where I used to read my law school textbooks when I had to like really put all, all these notes and figure out what the heck was going on in these cases. Yeah. And because I read it all pre-publication, I couldn't put it on Kindle because usually what I do is cut and paste on Kindle, make myself a file, and then I can be pretending to talk to you while I'm looking at my file. But in this case, I'm alerting Ernie, my redoubtable and wonderful producer, that I'm not going to be able to mute the page, the, the mic when I shuffle pages and get to real notes in real time um, and, and, and so forth and so on. So the first thing I want to say um, is having read this book, um, I found one of the passages in it was particularly moving. And that was when you talk about yourself in the third person as this boy mm. who is growing up and... Uh, I actually teared up. I got tears because about two thirds of the way through, of course, I knew you were talking about yourself. And I just found that story in itself, irrespective of the content of the book, so beautifully told, but also um, such a moving snapshot of your life and the way that life represents many people and the kind of self-doubt you had of a kind of an imposter syndrome of like, how did I get here? You know, what are the odds? I just thought that passage was terrific, and I have marked it, um, and I just want to share how it opens um, here, and it's on page 57, and it starts off, many years ago, a black teenager in, in the small town of Safety Harbor, Florida, had an unlikely dream. The boy shared his dream with a, his guidance counselor, a middle-aged white man unaccustomed to any lofty aspiration from his students, black or white at the local high school. The guidance counselor listened courteously and then revealed a look of concern. And then 
I hope everybody reads this book. And by the way, I, I love this book. And we've started a book club called It Has to Be Read. And we're including your book. I think it'll be in May. I love it. I told Ernie, I just said, this is a must read. This is not just another book. Uh, everybody should read this. And it's beautifully done. So thank you so much. But um, since I've got you here, why don't you tell us a little bit of that story in just your own personal background and narrative. And I'd like you to add some things that aren't here. For instance, I'm fascinated by this idea that you have um, these relationships that are not necessarily blood relatives kin, but mm. parental relationships and fathering relationships. I love that. And I was so taken by the way you describe the black family in America, as opposed to the sort of white idea um, of how people perceive family. And then your own experience, I love the way you talk about your own experiences. So if you don't mind, let's start personal. Okay. Your childhood, your growing up, who this boy was, tell that story and kind of where you are right now as we speak today, if you don't mind going there. I don't mind at all. And I really appreciate the question because, uh, you know, so much of what I talk about is political. It's about... Mm. What what are the larger, broader political themes? Um, but what this book is really about, it's a series of stories. It's, it's 25 chapters, and each chapter is a different story mm -hmm. about um, an experience uh, it, that deals with race in America. Yeah. And my publisher and editor pushed me to to tell these personal stories that you're, you're asking about, mm -hmm. um, particularly the, the, the story of my own journey, um, which is that you know, I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri. I mm -hmm. was born in a segregated hospital in, in inner city St. Louis uh, in a black hospital called Homer G. Phillips, which is no longer open. And um, that birth certificate that my mom received when I was born indicated that I was quote unquote Negro. Mm. So that was in August 28th, 1965. So from the very beginning, from the very first day I arrived on the planet, I was labeled because of my skin color, because of my race. So when people ask, well, why does everything have to be about race? Well, America made this decision to choose to yeah. designate people by their race. Mm -hmm. And for me, it meant that I was, as, to use the words of Ibram X. Kendi, I was stamped from the beginning mm -hmm. with this with this designation. So I grew up in St. Louis. I live, I move around a lot of places in St. Louis. Uh, then I moved to Clearwater, Florida, uh, where I go to two different high schools. I ended up going to three different high schools um, in the course of my youth. Um, and I speak to my guidance counselor about going to college. And the mm -hmm. guidance counselor, you know, this is like a middle class with some upper middle class and some lower income students in the school. Most of the lower income students are black. Most of the upper in, upper income students are white. And the guidance counselor looks at me and doesn't take me seriously. You know, I, I'm taking AP courses and honors courses, and I'm the president of the student government uh, at this point. I've, I've done, I've achieved, achieved a lot. I was on the varsity mm -hmm. track team. I was, you know, you uh, model UN, and a great debater and all this kind of stuff. But the, but the guidance counselor couldn't possibly conceive of the idea that I could be a, uh, a student at a top school. Yeah. So I told him I wanted to apply and he kind of told me, you know, I should dream lower. <laughs> yeah. Don't, don't, don't shoot so, so to such high ambition, such lofty goals. And I realized that I wanted to try it anyway, because I felt like uh, there was, you know, I felt like I'd always been underestimated in life and had been judged based on other people's standards. So I decided I would try anyway. I didn't get in everywhere I applied. Um, I didn't get into my top school that I wanted to go to, which was Stanford. Uh, but I did get into one of my second schools, which was Dartmouth. And um, it's an Ivy League college in the middle of New Hampshire. So it was a big transformation for me to go from from Clearwater, Safety Harbor, Florida, mm -hmm. all the way up to Hanover, New Hampshire with the weather transition. But it was a reflection of the fact that um, I had to find somewhere the courage to believe in myself when the world and society wasn't teaching me to do that. Yeah. You know, I, the, the school, the high school I went to was overwhelmingly white. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's a small percentage of black students. And I said the black students were mostly lower income students. And it was an overwhelmingly white school. And I don't think they they thought that a black kid 
you know, from this community could ever could be successful. Yeah. But I, en I ended up going to college and I didn't necessarily feel like I fit in from the beginning because a lot of my classmates, you know, were very wealthy and successful, went to prep schools. I went to school with two Rockefellers, yeah. you know, at the same time. Uh, half of those I, kids go up there to be on the ski team anyway. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, we had, we had a, the, the government building where I took uh, classes, the, the political science building was named after Nelson Rockefeller. And sure. his son was one of one of my one of my, you know, uh, uh, not classmates. He was a year ahead of me, but he was one of the students yeah, in, at school you know. the same time I was there. So it was just this whole sort of remarkable experience to be thrust into this environment and not mm -hmm. feeling like I was adequate because society had told me this, but realizing that I was just as smart as everybody else who was there. And mm -hmm. I just hadn't been validated because of who I was. And and that was a that was the that was the key point for me. That, you know, I, I tell the story because if you had just talked to my guidance counselor, you would never have imagined that that young boy in Safety Harbor, Florida, would be able to go to an Ivy League college, would be able to attend Harvard Law School, would be able to, to go to law school with Barack Obama, who became mm -hmm. the president of the United States, would be able to work in the White House for Bill Clinton, would be able to write seven books, would be able to work on CNN as a political commentator, uh, to, to do a reality show, mm -hmm. to, uh, to, to, to be able to, to, to start a, a national black civil rights organization. And all of this is because we make decisions about people at a very early age based yeah. on indicators that don't really tell us who they are. You know, mm -hmm. you can't just look at somebody's GPA or SAT or even just look at their race and decide that this person is going to be a success and is not going to be success. And what yeah. the top colleges are looking for is they're looking for people who are going to be leaders. I think mm -hmm. I was so, so pleased that Dartmouth College took a chance on me and decided that this black kid looks like he has potential. Let's, let's bring him in. And, and, and I'm glad they did because here I am today. Give him a shot. You know, something I want to comment on the, about the book, and I have a lot of quotes I want to go to here, but a general comment, your editor in, encouraged you to include some personal stories, which I'm very glad of because I enjoyed them. But when it gets to the political commentary, which is weighty, I don't mean complicated, but weighty in the sense of hard, hard to bear reading about in the same way that it's hard to look at Holocaust victims photographs. If you have a heart, you feel for people. Um, but you have a very light touch, uh, and I want to ask you a question. This will sound weird, but you come across in the book as ineffably kind. I really like you. I finished this book and I muttered to myself, I love Keith Boykin, and we've wow. never met. Wow. Um, uh, I'm just sort of tearing up because I finished it this morning and the impact of the book is great. Um, I just want to ask you, you know, where does this kindness come from? Who are you, Keith? Because there's a there's a love that comes through in these pages for both the United States of America, where, by the way, my son, who was in the Marine Corps, fought in Afghanistan and served this country. You're looking at all our faults, and yet in a weird way, you look at me and you say, I love you anyway. Let's do better. And I want to know where that comes from. Who are you? Wow. Now, that is the first time anyone has ever asked that question. So I really uh, have to dig deep to think about that one. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I feel like I'm a, I am a series of different emotions and viewpoints and values and beliefs. And sometimes they may seem like they're conflicting. On the one hand, I'm very passionate about issues I believe in. I'm, I'm on CNN and MSNBC sure. debating and arguing with people all the time. And people sometimes think that's my personality. That I'm like always out here fighting with people. Mm. And I actually, you know, I went, I was trained as a debater in high school, you know, and my debate coach, uh, you know, really told me what the tactics were. So I'm, I'm, I'm used to doing that. And I guess I'm good at that, but that's not who I am. I don't really even like to argue with people. I definitely don't like to argue with friends or in relationships. That's a, that's a, that's a, a, a deal breaker from the beginning. But I think I just, I just kind of always have been the outsider and the underdog wherever I've been. So I've mm. always kind of rooted for other outsiders and underdogs even if they weren't me or weren't part of the group that I was a part of. Uh, but I knew from the beginning that I didn't fit in. I didn't fit in um, in the mostly white schools that I went to because I was black. Mm. Um, I often didn't fit in into the conservative environments that I, where I was where I was located, especially at Dartmouth College in the 1980s and the Reagan 80s when it was very Republican and I was a liberal Democrat. 
And I was also a gay man, you know, and, and uh, I didn't know that when I was young. But as I mm -hmm. evolved, I knew there was something about me that was different. But all those different things helped to have an impact on the way I saw other people. So I remember when I was in college, the first time when I sort of had one of these experiences, we had a symbol at Dartmouth College called the Indian symbol, which was never mm -hmm. really officially adopted. But it was, you know, the Dartmouth was started in 1769 for Native American students, allegedly, but it really never served that purpose. For the first 200 years, only like a dozen Native American students graduated. But then in the 1960s, we start to have this whole sort of change at, 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 on college campuses. And Dartmouth starts to recruit people of color, African-Americans and Native American students. And they don't mm -hmm. like this idea we have this Indian symbol at the college. So the college officially disowns that symbol. But even in the 1980s, when I'm in college, there were classmates of mine who were still holding on to this symbol, which was more than a decade, this sure. decade long past. Uh, and it, to me, it was offensive. And I'm not even Native American. I was just like, I was just thinking to myself, well, if they don't like it, Hmm. Who are we to tell them that they should they should just they should suck it like up and it, yeah. deal with it? It just didn't make any sense to me. This whole like, this is what's kind of what's been going on in our country for the past several years now. It's like people feel like they want to have the need, they want they have the right to be mean. You know, they, like they were mean. People have been mean throughout society, but I think people, as more and more people come into society, people of different different races and religions and backgrounds, and start to be accepted, then we 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 have to deal with that. And a lot of people don't want to deal with that because they're more comfortable just looking at the other and saying that those people don't deserve to be treated equally or don't deserve the dignity and respect that that you and I do. And so I, I just feel like that sense of being an outsider has really always uh, influenced me in the way I've tried to sort of navigate the world. Yeah, well, it certainly informs the voice in this book. Um, let me reintroduce you. My guest is Keith Boykin, um, and he's a New York Times bestselling author, TV and film producer, former CNN political commentator. And Keith's book, which I have just finished reading today on the pub date, is Why Everything has to be about race. Why Why does everything have to be about race? Actually, <laughs> the same title would make sense for the book. Yeah. Why everything has yeah. to be about race is yeah. the answer. Uh, 25 arguments that won't go away. Um, please subscribe to In Conversation with Frank Schaefer on Apple Podcasts and to my Substack. It has to be said at frankschaefer.substack.com. And I'm making this book, by the way, Keith's book, uh, a book on our book club. Um, and the title of that is It Has to Be Read. Uh, and I think we're going to do that in May. So let me get to a couple things in the book that I just want to talk about in terms of just um, some some things that just jumped out, just crazy stuff that, by the way, I didn't know this one here. And I know that this is a tangential point, but I want to show the scope of the problem we have. And this is a weird way to do it. The development of The Wizard of Oz also indicated how racist ideas were so normalized that they were not a barrier to success for people who espoused them. One such person was L. Frank Baum, the author of the children's novel on which the film was based. In an 1890 newspaper editorial, Baum openly called for the genocide of indigenous people in America. Quote, the whites by law of conquest, by justice of civilization, are masters of the American continent, and the best safety of the frontier settlements will be secured in the total annihilation of the few remaining Indians. Why not annihilation? Their glory has fled, their spirit broken, their manhood effaced. Better that they die than they live the miserable wretches that they are. I know that's an odd thing because he's talking about Native Americans, but boy, somehow that leapt off the page to me in terms of just capturing how deep the problem is on so many fronts. First, that's his view. Secondly, he's a published author. Third, this guy has written, quote, one of the great American classics that everybody turns to and loves. And that could have been pulled out of Mein Kampf, the view of the other. Let's make more living room to the West and invade, you know, whatever, or let's head East and kill all the Slavs so there's more room for the Germans. I mean, what the hell? It's a great example. You you pull it in. And by the way, just to people who are going to read this book, um, the book has many, many surprises in it of a, of a good kind in the sense that Keith, you know, takes us places that, at least for me, I haven't been. So thank you. But um, let me get to the actual writing of the book then. You're using these incredible examples. You've obviously given so much thought to the subject and you've lived it, which is amazing. Um, 
what was your process in terms of zeroing in on how you would tell the story without just pointing an accusatory finger the whole time at your reader if he doesn't happen to be a Black American? And also, by the way, I'm amazed in this book at how you single out so many Black Americans like Justice Thomas and others who have, in your view, betrayed themselves and our country by pretending that this white racist view that predominates is somehow okay and not as serious as people are are making it. I know I've thrown a lot at you, but just go wherever you want to go with it. <laughs> yeah, I um, I the, the story the structure for this is something that developed organically. Mm. Uh, I originally the, the, this is how it actually started. I remember a few years ago during one of the periods of racial gaslighting. I remember in politics, uh, a group of people started posting these bingo cards mm -hmm. online. And they were racist bingo cards, I think is what they were called. Uh, I'm going to dig one out and maybe repost it this week. Uh, but they, the idea was that they showed some of the arguments that, that white people often make to discredit racism. Uh, things like, well, he should have just complied with the police, or why do you have to have a Black History Month? We don't have a White History Month. Or, um, you know, affirmative action is reverse racism, or we gave you Obama, what are you complaining about? You know, there's all, there's all these sorts of arguments that Black people hear all the time. And I, I thought, you know, it would, be, it would be great to sort of put all this together and to have a response for all of those arguments so that people, A, don't have to go do the research every time that they hear one of these arguments uh, and B have this handy reference guide so they can, you know, show, show people or just give it to somebody uh, as a, as a gift to, to let them know this is why your argument doesn't make any sense. Uh, but, but C um, just sort of to walk through each of those different steps. So I chose 25 arguments because I thought that was a good number to pick. And I didn't know where the stories were going to come from for each of those arguments. Uh, but it just some of them just I didn't know about a lot of the things that I wrote about in the book from when I started the process. And some mm. of them I don't even know where they came from, but just like there's a story of Earl Butts, who I'd never heard of before, who was mm -hmm. a, a member of the the Nixon and Ford cabinet in the 1970s. Mm. And he made this horrendously racist comment about black men. And all they want is I can't even say it on the air, but all they want is, you know sex with a white woman basically yeah, uh, yeah. And, and a clean pair of shoes and, yeah. I, and i and he's a member of a, of a federal government cabinet in the nixon yeah. administration the ford administration and people defended them and he said oh he doesn't have a racist bone in his body yeah and, right and, and so a lot of it is just experiencing the frustration that 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 we as black people feel that people of color feel that other minorities and marginalized mm -hmm. groups of people feel and trying to express that for people who are who are not parts of those communities, that um, these things don't make any sense. We have heard these before. You're not breaking any new ground by saying these yeah. things over and over to us, and this is why you're wrong. But yeah. you know, I, I just want to say one thing too. The book starts with a quotation from Toni Morrison, mm -hmm. uh, and I did this on purpose because Toni Morrison has this great gave this great speech at Portland State University in 1970s, I think 1975, where she said the function of racism is distraction. Yeah, and that 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 is the, the whole point of all this stuff is to keep you distracted. If if all these different groups, marginalized groups, come together and work collectively for a mm -hmm. better country, a better planet. We wouldn't have all these problems, but they want us to be divided. So they, the yeah. people who actually run things are actually, they want groups of people who, who are marginalized to be fighting amongst themselves instead mm -hmm. of fighting among the, the rich and powerful, fighting yeah, against and, the rich and powerful. Yeah, exactly. And you see that on in so many places. Let me just jump into something that you talk about Martin Luther King. You say, um, I think if Martin Luther King was alive today, he would, dot, dot, dot. Those are the only words on the screen in a popular, I guess you call them GIFs or GIF, widely used on black Twitter. At the very moment, a pasty bow-tied man begins to white-splain, which I like, I hear mansplain sometimes, <laughs> what Dr. King would really want. He's hit by a chair and a black boy runs on screen and punches him. It's really a funny anecdote, but the thing is, it then goes on to talk about the way white Americans um, like to try to tell 
black Americans what Martin Luther King really stood for. And we look for the sort of cute image of I have a dream and we're all going to get on and little boys playing together and completely gloss over, ignore, bury. The real message was that, yeah, that dream lives when there's justice, but you have to get there first. Uh, I hope I put words in your mouth. I'm, I'm making a synopsis of a big section of the book. I just thought that was incredibly powerful. The way we you know, almost corporatize. It's sort of the same thing as greenwashing. You know, all of a sudden an oil company is going to clean up the environment and they're greenwashing. They're saying here, you know, BP or Shell or whoever, we're doing this thing. Well, similarly, Martin Luther King Day rolls around. Somebody has to say something because it's the day. And it's always this kind of innocuous whitewashing of the statement. Can we just take a couple minutes and talk about M Martin Luther King's place in history? Mm. What it really was, because I think that's a tremendous passage in your book, and I don't want to just sit here and read it because we've got you here. Can we just talk about that for a minute? Because I just love that whole section. Thank you. I think whitewashing is the perfect word that yeah. you use there, because what has happened is that we've taken someone who was a radical, revolutionary thinker, mm. and we've homogenized him to the point where he has become innocuous in the eyes of so many because they've re we've reduced him to one single quotation from one speech. And that was a speech on August 28th, 1963, where he said that I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a world where they will be judged by the content of their character, not by the color of their skin. Okay, he said that, but A, he didn't say that to mean that he thought that color should be ignored or that it would be ignored. He was saying that he wanted people, he wanted his four little children not to be judged negatively because of their color of their skin. He didn't want them people to, he didn't want people to ignore the color of their skin. But B, he also said a lot of radical things in that speech and in other speeches that really didn't please people. He condemned police brutality in that speech. He talked about voting rights and the need for equal equality and justice for black people in that speech. He talked about black people who were protesting being locked up unfairly in that speech. And then in other speeches, mm. he gave he made really controversial remarks about, for example, the Vietnam War. A, a year before he died, on April 4th, 1967, Dr. King traveled to the Riverside Church in Harlem in, in New York City and gave a speech condemning the Vietnam War. Mm. That was incredibly unpopular. Even in the black community, people thought he'd gone too far by, by doing that because mm. he sort of focused on civil rights issues. But Dr. King said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. As a result... A, he was assassinated a year a year to the day after he gave that speech. But B, um, he was not very popular when he lived. Mm -hmm. A poll that was conducted in the 1960s uh, found that Dr. King that 60 more than 60 percent of Americans had an unfavorable opinion of him. Yeah, and so and the the ideas that he, he espoused, you know, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, the Fair Housing Act of 1968, all of which he championed. Um, those things led a lot of white people to leave the Democratic Party because mm -hmm. Lyndon Johnson signed those bills and moved to the Republican Party. And what's happened since that time is that we, we've had this sort of sort of re political realignment. And a lot of Republicans didn't like the idea of having a holiday named after Dr. King. Um, sure. Ronald Reagan, who actually was forced to sign the bill after some many, many years of protest, Ronald Reagan um, was against the idea because he thought mm -hmm. Dr. King was a communist. Yeah. And he said that, but um, but he he realized that he you know he couldn't afford to uh, to oppose this, so he eventually caved in and and signed the bill allowing the Dr. King holiday. But there was decades of opposition uh, to that, and now we created this image of him as though he was just this wonderful saint that everyone loved, and that wasn't the case when he was alive. Yeah, and wouldn't be the case today if his words had not been you know white splained and whitewashed and made more palatable. Um, I want to go to something that actually relates to this in the book. I think I'm reading from page 107 here. Many conservatives also engage in cynical double standards in their law and order rhetoric, attacking young people of color for failing to comply with the police, but celebrating rich white guys who openly defy the law and fail to comply. When young black kids committed a simple misdemeanor in New York City, they had to be prosecuted, according to former mayor Rudy Giuliani. But when a powerful white president violated the laws of the Constitution years later, he deserved sympathy and compassion. And then you go on and you also 
uh, make have a wonderful thing, by the way, that's like a little fictional sort story in itself where you talk about the difference between, you know, what would happen if a black kid went down and shot up some white people at a at a demonstration and Rittenhouse becoming a hero and getting invited to to meet with Trump um, in Mar-a-Lago. And you write it as a story as if a black kid had done this and how he would, you know, be welcomed and everything would be fine. I thought it was very well done. But just talk about that whole anomaly between white and black, quote, justice or justice for black people, because obviously this is a subject you see a lot in the news in terms of people being shot and so forth. But you kind of go deeper on it. And so go tell, take us there a little bit, because I think you told that part of this story so very well. Well, I'll tell you a different story. Um a few days, I think it was on May 30th, a few days after um, George Floyd was killed in Minneapolis, mm -hmm. I was covering a protest in New York City. It started in Harlem. And mm -hmm. I was on my bicycle uh, following the protesters, uh, recording them and posting it online at the same time. Um, and the protest moved on to the West Side Highway, which is one of the two main thoroughfares, mm -hmm. you know, major traffic thoroughfares in, in New York City and Manhattan. Um, and the police came. They arrested me as I was covering the protest. I told mm -hmm. them I was with the press. They said it didn't matter. And they put me in, put me in handcuffs and took me to jail. So I didn't mm -hmm. get a chance to finish covering the protest. Uh, this happened the same time when one of my colleagues from CNN, Omar Jimenez, was also arrested uh, mm. on air in Minneapolis while covering one of the George Floyd protests, mm. while his white colleague, uh, who was at the same protest, was not arrested mm -hmm. for doing the exact same thing. Yeah. Um, and then Cal Rittenhouse goes off to he he crosses state lines with an illegal gun he's too young to own he, he goes off to uh kenosha and he shoots two people and kills them hmm. white young white 17 year old kills two people and kills them walks away with the gun over his shoulder yeah walks down the street with the with the murder weapon hmm. and the police are notified. Someone yells to the police, hey, this guy just shot two people. Yeah. And the police ignore the person telling them that. The police, I, I didn't know my phone was on. The police actually tell them, uh, police actually ask Cal, they ask yeah. Cal, hey, is, is there somebody need help up there? And they they ignore this guy with a gun, a young white guy with a gun, who has just shot two people. And even though they've been told that he's killed someone, they just let him walk by. Yeah, and of course, the image of the whole open carry thing carried forward into all these American situations where you've got these white people with guns, weapons of war strapped to their shoulders, loaded outside state houses, this kind of intimidation factor, you know, there's a whole book there as well, irrespective of the story you're telling, just on the kind of barbarism and descent into, you know, lynch mob American politics revisited into another era just through the open carry laws and everything that goes with this, including his story. And then, of course, when you take that to the next step and say, and how would that play, you know, if there was a group of young black men with uh, AR-15 strapped to their, you know, how does this work for you? And of course, this is the kind of discussion that white Americans don't want to have um, because it's so self-evident. You know, there's not even a question of how, you know, that you bring up in your point, January 6th. What if that was a black mob storming the Capitol, tearing things down and beating the police? I mean, um, you, you know, how long would have it taken before... Uh, you know, one protester got shot as she crashed her way through a window uh, and threatening people. And she was turned into a national hero. Um, you know, it would have been like scenes from the after the French Revolution when Napoleon put cannons in the street and just ordered the whole mob gunned down with cannon fire. That's what would have happened. Well, and remember what that's, happened. That's where we're living. Well, remember what happened when the protests took place in Lafayette Square Park across from the White House a few years ago when Trump was president. Yeah. And this was a, a nonviolent protest. Nobody nobody entered the White House or came right. close to entering the White House. But um, 
they ordered tear gas uh, yeah. against the protesters. And I'd never seen that before. I never thought I would see that in my country. Yeah. Uh, and, and outside the White House, the place where I work uh, in the Clinton administration, that, that they would be tear gassing protesters who were engaged in civil disobedience or protesting. Hmm. Now, I can imagine they'd be arrested, but to actually tear gas them, it reminded me of what took place in 1989 in Tiananmen Square in yes. Beijing, China. Sure. Uh, to see that in America was stunning. Yeah. And of course, this was the same event at which he then shows up, uh, comes out of the bunker in the White House eventually when he feels safe enough and stands there with a Bible. Upside down, apparently. Upside down, you know, right. very symbolic there. You fly the flag upside down as a, a sign of distress. <laughs> and he's flying the Bible upside down in an unintended sign of national distress. Um, and of course, at that same tear gassing, you also see something else that you, uh, you know, journalist, um, Keith Boykin, who's written this fabulous book, Why Does Everything Have to Be About Race? You're very aware of this, too. And that is one of the other things he stirred up, besides the racism that we have percolating just below the surface all the time, whether it's his full page ad about the kids who were misidentified as rapists in Central Park, you know, and all that, all the way up to the present tense. In addition to that, he never loses an opportunity to vilify the press. He hates the media, as all authoritarian figures do, who fear exposure. Everything is fake news that doesn't laud him. Those two things come together, and a group of journalists are beaten casually on the way by by the police in that same riot. And they're not even, they're not black or even from the States. It's a foreign journalism group who are just clubbed because they're they have cameras. So take a minute just um, to go away from the immediate subject of your book, although it's very related, just into this authoritarian trend that is both racist, but also, you know, you're 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 wrong on three. I mean, in this sense, you're black, you're gay, you're a member of the media and, you know, you're getting arrested while trying to cover related subjects. So just talk a little bit from the point of view of you as a reporter in the context of a country that wants to reelect a man who basically asks his followers to beat up media people in a very almost direct manner. Well, you know, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned this because um, I spent five years working for CNN as a contributor yeah. uh, during during the entire Trump administration from uh, all of 2017, 18, 19, 20, and 21. And um, it was a very challenging experience for me because it the Trump years were so chaotic. Sure, I don't I don't think people fully remember and appreciate it. I do because I had to live through it, and mm -hmm. I had to know everything was going on. So every day I'd wake up, whatever time I get up, six in the morning, seven in the morning, there were tweets that I had to to look into and respond to, or uh, you know, to be able to know to to be able to talk about uh, on on air. Um, or, or new policies that were being announced that that were just completely inconsistent with anything that's ever happened in, in American history, um, and it was it was tiring, it was exhausting having to to deal with that, and that was before he led the insurrection, you know, a lot of that. So it was just the idea of having to be inundated with this assault on democracy at a close personal range as a journalist who was covering him for five years was mm. was very challenging. So when I went to write the book, I initially included a lot more about Donald Trump in the book. Mm, sure. But my, when my editor told me to take it out. <laughs> yeah. I'm kind of glad that he did. But my editor said, you know, this has got to be, be this book has to be beyond Donald Trump. Uh, so, the, the, you know, he's, a, he's included in the book because he's a part of it. But mm. the reality is that Donald Trump didn't start racism in America or authoritarianism, right. uh, that these disturbing trends have existed for quite some time, mm. and that people are clinging to them now because they feel like they're losing some sense of privilege. Mm. Uh, that there was a, a, a few things that have happened in the past few decades that have challenged the way a lot of people who are white and conservative perceive the world. One. Yeah. Yeah. is that Democrats have won the popular vote in seven of the last eight presidential elections. Mm -hmm. That creates a problem for white conservative Republicans who feel sure. like they're the majority, but they're not. Um, two, uh, Barack Obama lost uh, the white vote in both of his elections, and mm -hmm. Donald Trump won it in both of his elections. 
Yeah. Which relates to three. The reason why Donald Trump became popular is that he tapped into this sort of sort of anti-Obama racism. Absolutely. By using this five and a half year campaign questioning Barack Obama's birth certificate, yeah. because he knew that there were people who were really upset about the idea of having a black president. There was no post-racial America. People got more upset about that. Well, um, and I think because he was able to get away with that lie, repeating it again and again and again, then all of a sudden he's learning from Joseph Goebbels in Germany, who says the big lie, that one worked great. Let's keep going. I mean, I think that if he had been, if he had been, you know, properly denounced across the board, including by Republicans for telling that lie about Barack Obama, oh, I can get away with this, you know, sort of, I can shoot somebody on Fifth Avenue and get away with it. He got away with that lie. Why not just keep going? And then your editor may, <laughs> when your book comes out again in uh, another edition a year from now, let's hope he doesn't come to you and say, hey, in the new edition, since Trump <laughs> is president again, let's revise this and put Trump back in. I have a question for you. I just want to reintroduce you. This is Keith Boykin, a New York Times bestselling author, et cetera. And his book, which I'm holding up here, and I have dog-eared horribly um, huh. and because of all my notes in it, which I love this book, by the way, I think it's terrific, um, is out now. And uh, you're listening to In Conversation with Frank Schaefer. Please subscribe to Frank Schaefer on Apple Podcasts and my Substack. It has to be said at frankschaefer.substack.com. And we're making Keith's book um a book in our It Has to Be Read book club, probably in May. And hopefully, Keith, we can get you back after we get questions from people who read it uh, to interact with you. I want to jump to a quote here that I marked, um, change the subject a little bit. But it really spoke to me. And I guess the ultimate compliment you can pay another writer is to say, I'm ordering this book on Kindle so that when I copy this, to quote it in a book I'm working on now, because it's so resonated with me, I don't want to I'm a bad typer and I'm dyslexic on top of it. So I'll be ordering your book. You will get your 25 cents from me after all, because I'm <laughs> I'm going to buy your book. This one was okay. free, but I'm going to buy it on Kindle now that it's out. Today's the pub date, by the way, everybody. Uh, the dominant narrative about our community since the mid 20th century is that black families are broken and mm -hmm. that this failure explains many, if not all of the social ills that have fallen on African-Americans, this narrative prevents, presents a convenient explanation for black inequality and excuses the larger society of any duty for self-examination or policy change. I strongly disagree with this, quote, broken family, end quote, narrative. Black American families face enormous obstacles in society as they have since the first black people arrived on these shores in chains. Our families are, and this is the wrestling around that I warned you about because it's in paper here, uh -huh. far from perfect, and many of them suffer from serious dysfunction. But we must not ignore two other facts. First, Black families were intentionally broken by racist white systems that refused to recognize our marriages, respect the integrity of our familiar relationships, or protect our safety. Second, many white families are also dysfunctional in America, despite the relative socioeconomic economic advantages they enjoy from generations of racial privilege. You know, that brings up so many things. One of them is just that, you know, we're living in a day and age which isn't very friendly to good relationships, period. Uh, you know, I'm not a big fan. I'm 71 years old and I was around when the sexual revolution was going to be this big, wonderful thing. And I have a friend question for all my liberal friends sometimes is, well, how's all that working out for you now when you have kids scrambling around on their phones who can't even figure out how to date? and have no clue about relationships because between social media and everything else, it's all gone away. You know, when you look at the black American experience and you look at Thomas Jefferson, who you talk about, who's raping his 14 year old slave and, and realizing the abuse that, you know, the sexual abuse that white males in particular were exercising against the black community and then breaking their families up when they sold them it's like, excuse me, um, the amazing thing is that the black family is, is coherent, that the bigger black church family is coherent, that there's anybody around in the black community who survived any of this. And I think your book makes such a good point on these cheap shots to excuse white malfeasance all through our history of, well, like if they, you know, if they could just get their shit together or do this or that or the other. So go a little bit into the black family situation. But beyond that, 
into this perennial excuse making by white commentators uh, who who tried to who tried to get past the fact of what we did, and I want you to transition from that into your idea about reparations because that's a huge topic in your book, and you're saying we can't get anywhere till we really recognize what was done, and the only way to really put a peg in this and say let's admit what happened is to go to reparations. So talk a little bit about how you deal with the black family issues in the book, and then let's go before we wrap this up into your reparations recommendations. I want to do a little detailed exploration there because, you know, I think you bring a really authoritative voice to the subject and I'd like to hear it. And I'd like people who listen or watch this to hear your argument for that. Okay. Well, that's a lot. I hope I can remember all that's a lot. <laughs> okay. Hey, I'm 71. I don't remember shit. <laughs> You're going to have to remember my question. Okay. Or Ernie can put a note in the note section saying, here's what you asked him. Okay. Um, so um, the, the Black family story, I start the chapter in the Black family by talking in sort of an unusual way, yeah. uh, by sharing a story about George Stinney Jr., mm -hmm. who I don't know as, if he's that well known, but he was the youngest person to be executed. Yeah, 14 years old, and they electrocuted the poor guy. Yeah, only like 90 days after he was arrested. Um, Unbelievable. It's practically a lynch mob. Yeah, um, definitely. And the, the, it, it's a sad story because I, I tell the story about George Denny's family, how mm -hmm. they were God-fearing family who went to church every week and um, they raised their own food and and um, they all they were all gainfully employed and they did everything America said they were supposed to do. Right. But then um, a white mob decided to attack George Stinney Jr., this young kid, and accuse him of murdering a white girl. Um, and they brought him in without the law, extrajudicially. They they forced him to to confess to a crime they did not commit, mm -hmm. uh, which he never they ne he never signed a written confession to it. By the way, mm -hmm. um, they put him on trial almost immediately, and then they electrocuted him. Yeah, and he had virtually no defense in in law. Um, the he uh, his lawyer didn't even bother to file appeal. It only took a few minutes for the all white jury to reach their conclusion, to reach their, to their verdict. Um, and then years later, a judge threw out the uh, threw out the conviction after he was executed. And so, he was so slight and so young, he didn't even fit the electric chair, and they had trouble adjusting the straps to kill him. And, yeah, he was he was such a tiny, tiny, tiny young boy. He, he couldn't even fit into the electric chair, uh, you know, because it was made for adults. And then, as you say, a few uh, it, very in recent American history. I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Yeah. So yeah, years later, he he his his conviction was thrown out, vacated by by a judge, and you know a lot of good that did him because he was murdered. He was killed, murdered. Yeah, very much like state. Emmett Till, you know. Exactly. Same deal. Uh, um, yes, except that Emmett Till was was lynched by private people. Um, yeah, and but I mean, the, the state. spirit of the thing is yeah. identical. You, exactly. You know, grab a kid off the street, kill him. Exactly. And so um, this whole notion that the black family, if the if black families just pull their pull their pull themselves together, that everything will be okay, is not consistent with the reality that even the black families who do do the right thing, sure, and then find their families torn apart. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, as we see with George Sidney Jr. Plus, the second part of this is that this idea that somehow this disintegration of black families has been taking place since maybe the 1960s, people say, since welfare came along. And the black family, you know, dis was disrupted because of that. They all were on welfare and they, they won't want to work and all these other stereotypes right. people say. And what the problem with that story, aside from the fact that it's not true, is that it doesn't explain what happened to black families for centuries before sure. welfare, before the 1960s. Why were black families struggling before that time? Why were black women still subjected to, to sexual abuse? Why were black men still treated dis disparately from, mm -hmm. from, uh, from the state, from the police? Why were black children 
um, forced to to go to second class schools, second tier schools, uh, in segregated facilities. Why were the black families under assault and struggling for hundreds of years before any of those things happened? Mm. So that that's part of the problem. Then the the third part of it is a personal story for me, which is that I come from an untraditional family. You know, my last name is Boykin. People are always asking me, are you related to the Boykins in this city or that city, wherever I go? And yeah. the truth is, I'm not related to any Boykin. So Boy Boykin is my adoptive father's name. Sure. And and I discovered years later that it wasn't even his original name, but it mm -hmm. was the name he, kept, he got from somewhere else. But it's a whole story of how black families evolve and how families evolve that it's not necessarily fit doesn't necessarily always fit into the, the traditional narrative of the way a family structure should look look mm. like so i didn't meet my biological father until i turned 50. sure um and and i have two children of my own who are not my biological children Mm -hmm. uh, but they're my adopted children and so the, the the way that we construct our families sometimes in in black con, black family units is not necessarily the way that fits into um an easy societal understanding one mm -hmm. of the stereotypes that people have is that black uh fathers are not uh involved in their children's lives mm -hmm. and the reality is that the studies actually show from the federal government studies show that black fathers are actually in many ways more involved in their children's lives than white fathers are now yeah, it's true. especially in in people suffering in a socioeconomic strata that are having a hard time the black fathers as you point out with substantiation you know are shown statistically to show up more than their counterparts in the same economic uh, strata right exactly and it, it is true and i think this is the point the last point i want to make about this it is true that black fathers are less likely to be married to their black female spouses or, sure. or partners. But that doesn't mean that they're not involved. And people always mis mistakenly assume that, that those two things are correlated. Yeah. Uh, and they're not. Marriage is an expensive thing to do in, in our society. And yeah. it comes with consequences as well as responsibilities. And so the absence of a, a marriage certificate is not the indication of the absence mm. of of love and family support. Um, yeah. And I know this because I never, uh, my father who gave me the name Boykin never adopted me officially. I just mm. put his name on my birth certificate. Yeah, <laughs> you know, there was he wasn't an official adoption. He just decided to do that. Um, and that's kind of the way um, black families have been mm. forced to operate going back to slavery to segregation to the present. Now. Yeah, sorry. I, I make uh, go ahead. I interrupt. I, I know you wanted me to talk about reparations, or you want to talk about something else. No, I don't want to interrupt you. What? Finish your thought. I jumped in too quick. Oh no, I was, I was finished about that. I wanted. To, I was seeing if you wanted me to dig into the. Oh yeah, I just want to throw a little a little question in here that is a good one that um, uh, Ernie, um, who produces this show, was reminding me. We've been asking. I, I interviewed uh, Gerald Baker, um, who is a Wall Street Journal uh, editor. And also it's been at the Financial Times. And I also authored uh, recently journalist Tim Alberta from The Atlantic. And I asked them a question that I'm going to ask you as a media person, and then we're going to get back to the reparations thing and finish there. Um, what is the role of the media in an age of information overload? It's related to everything you're doing. It's not directly from the book, but I'm just interested. You're a journalist. What do you say to that? Well, I think first we have to define what the media is. Or everything. Are. We're the media now, I guess. That's well, what you're saying. It's Exactly what I was saying, because we have social media, we have uh, we have independent media, we have yeah. legacy media. All well, those... But the gatekeepers are gone. You know, we're just winging it now. And that fits in with the whole fake news narrative and all this crap conspiracism and everything else. So I don't know where you want to go with that. But the question is, you know, what's the role of the media? However you want to define it, I guess, maybe define what it is and talk about it a minute. Well, the, the the disappearance of the gatekeepers is both a good thing and a bad thing. Mm -hmm. It's a good thing because it allows ordinary people to have their voices presented who weren't often included, who were usually excluded from the di di from the dialogue or the discussion because no one thought to include this person from this marginalized group before. The bad thing about it is that we don't necessarily have a consistent set of standards that people are supposed to follow in terms of telling the stories uh you know I, I i'll be the first to say that the the legacy media get it wrong a lot mm -hmm. but but what the 
what the established legacy media have a duty to do, though, is to correct themselves when they get it wrong. They don't always do that, but they have a duty to do that. If I or you or anyone else who's a citizen journalist, I'm not, I'm not sure if, if you're a citizen journalist anyway, but if a citizen journalist who is not necessarily associated with an institution where they have that obligation or doesn't have a personal sense of obligation or ethical duty to, to do so, if I make a mistake, I'm not obligated to go and correct it and print a print print uh, a, a you know a, a correction on in in my publication or something. Mm. I would do so because I want people to know that I, I I value the truth. But a lot of people don't do that, and so there's a lot of misinformation that's, that's being spread. There was misinformation that was being spread before before in the in the legacy media too. A lot of it is from so-called groupthink, where people would get together and they would think, well, this is what we all believe and we're all going to report this. Uh, and that's how we sometimes get into wars that we don't need to be in, or we start to believe policies that, that don't necessarily help us because we tend to, to, to believe whatever it is the officials who are, who are communicating with us are telling us. But I think the role of the media is even more important today when it's being challenged by authoritarian figures who want to question anything that makes them look bad. And mm. by authoritarian figures, I really mean Donald Trump, but he's created a whole network of other people who followed his footsteps from Kerry Lake to Ron DeSantis and many others. And so we have to be vigilant in telling the truth, not just in giving both sides, which is sort of the old fashioned traditional model. Well, I'll tell one side and tell the other side. Mm -hmm. That doesn't really work with some issues. You know, I, I, it, you can't say um, genocide is good and genocide is bad. You can't say that, um, that homophobia is good and homophobia is bad. Racism is good and racism is bad. You can't say anti-Semitism is good and anti-Semitism is bad. You, you, you have to be able to say clearly what is right and what is wrong. Mm -hmm. And I think journalists are afraid of doing that, be, have been afraid of doing that for far too long because they are afraid of being criticized uh, as being biased. Mm -hmm. And Donald Trump has made them even more fearful of doing that because the moment they say something to challenge him, even something accurate to challenge him, he will question and critique them and criticize them and call them fake news. Yeah. So it's a it's a big responsibility. Yeah. Well, thank you. And I'd like to just get now to this question that you talk about in some depth in your book, um, and that is the whole reparations issue that you bring up as needful uh, as a step in a real step that says, okay, you know, at least it holds up some hope that we can get past some of this at some point. Make your case for the reparations and just talk to us about the importance that you talk about um, in this book. Uh, why does everything have to be about race? And and the book that we're going to have in our book club, people will be so fascinated by by the whole book, but just go there a little bit in this chapter on reparations. Well, yeah, the chapter in reparations is actually the longest chapter in the book. Yeah. And originally it was going to be two or three chapters and I, mm -hmm. and I or at least divided up into subsections, but the editor suggested that to keep it all together in one chapter. Um, and part of the reason why is because it's, it's probably the one idea that even white liberals and progressives have the most difficulty accepting. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea that it's not necessarily, and, and I want to be clear, it's not necessarily that they have difficulty accepting the idea because they think it's wrong. Mm. They have difficulty accepting it because mm. they feel like they don't want to be held responsible for it. They don't want to have to pay the pay the consequences for it. Nobody wants to have to fork over money out of their own pocketbook to help somebody else, but they feel like they didn't do anything to to uh to cause that. That's the that's the argument typically. I start this chapter by going back in time to 1863. Um, and actually, it was a time uh, I, I dig into a, a particular family, an enslaved Black family in Maryland. And I show how that family was torn apart uh, by slavery. And then I show one person, one young member of the family who was bought by this is the time when people could actually buy human beings, bought by a local hotel owner in Washington, D.C. And Abraham Lincoln in 1863 signs a bill called the Emancipated Concept, uh, 
the, uh, the, the emancipated, uh, I've lost, I can't remember the name of the, 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 of the legislation right now, but it'll come to me again. I should look your book up and... <laughs> oh, the Compensated Emancipation Act, that's what I think. Yeah, it. Uh, yeah this is the first interview, hopefully I'll, I'll remember by the time I get to the second and third, you know. Uh, but the Compensated Emancipation Act uh, essentially does two or three things. First, it frees all Black people who are enslaved in the District of Columbia. Because mm -hmm. we're in the middle of the war, it was it was seen as sort of an anti-war measure, a, a pro-war measure, an anti-Confederacy measure, mm -hmm. uh, and it was it was putting the District of Columbia consistent with the policy that Lincoln was about to advocate for the, the adoption of the Thirteenth Amendment. Mm -hmm. Second, though, and this is the crucial part. Second, it provides reparations to white slave owners. It gives money to the white people who had owned slaves. Yeah, in, re in return for the loss of the value of the slaves that they own. Yeah. So this is a history starting from the very beginning of the uh, the abol of the official abolition movement. We were giving out reparations, but we were giving it out to the white people who were losing revenue. Yeah. But we weren't giving it out to the black people, the black Americans who had actually given their entire lives. Their yeah. children's lives or, or their grandparents' lives and their great-grandparents' lives had been dedicated in the service of building the country without compensation. Yeah. You know, the Fifth Amendment to the Constitution says that, that no property shall be taken without compensation, uh, without just compensation to mm. the person who's, who's, who is taken from. Well, America allowed Black people to have our property, our personal property, our, our, our sure. beings taken from us for hundreds of years and never compensated us for us. Mm. Meanwhile, it not only compensated the white enslavers, but it also continued the pattern of compensating other people, Native Americans, Japanese Americans, Italian Americans, in different instances, American government and the American government has provided reparations to people who have been deprived of a particular uh, property or benefit in mm. the society. The only reason why it doesn't happen with Black people is because people are concerned that doing so will, A, cost a lot of money, and yeah. B, create a disruption in the social social structure that gives privilege to white people. Mm. And that's really the problem. You know, there's an old saying, if you're accustomed to privilege, equality feels like oppression. Yeah. And there are a lot of people who are benefiting today, don't even realize that they're benefiting from the history of, of slavery and segregation. The mm -hmm. law school that I attended was founded in, at Harvard Law School, was founded in part from the money that was created from the sale of enslaved black people mm -hmm. hundreds of years ago. The, it, you know, the, the bank where I banked was, was founded by, by was supported by the, the 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 revenue that came from enslaved black people. Mm -hmm. And so if you go through history and almost almost any of our legacy institutions, they were built in part, in large part, because of the contributions of African Americans who were not compensated. And after centuries or sometimes even just decades, that compensation imbalance still exists. So sure. white America is, is still benefiting from the privileges and black Americans are never been have never been uh, compensated. One mm. last point. There's a common narrative in some um, sort of progressive circles that says we don't really need racial justice. Let's just focus on economic justice. You know, the problem mm. with that theory is that it doesn't it, it doesn't account for the imbalances that currently exist sure uh, the racial disparities for example the black unemployment rate has almost always been twice the white unemployment rate for almost mm. the entire history of our nation when we've been recording the data but if you you have two people say one person has a hundred dollars another person has ten dollars and you decide you're going to give a hundred dollars to everybody for economic equality well suddenly the black person has a hundred and ten dollars but the white person has Two hundred and ten dollars. Sure. sure. So you haven't you haven't eliminated the imbalance. You haven't eliminated the racial disparities, and that's what we have to work on doing. We can't just pretend that passing a law in nineteen sixty four eliminates all those disparities and consider everybody equal. You have yeah. to go back and have some active work of compensation. Yeah, and I think that your point is made well here, but also made really well in the book. And I just think you've written an important book. Um, in in so many ways. And I look forward, as I said, to putting it in the book club. So let me just wrap this up by saying you've been listening to and or watching um, In Conversation with Frank Schaefer. And 
Keith Boykin has been my guest today, and his book is Why Does Everything Have to Be About Race? Question mark. And it comes out of a conversation that he had with someone who questioned him at a, a talk he was giving, who sort of threw this at him, and the book begins with answering that. And um, Keith, let me just say, it's really been an honor and a, and a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, you're, as I said, and one question that <laughs> I kind of tossed you a curveball, just saying that you come across as someone who is so generous in their point of view in the midst of being justifiably angry. Um, you're you're a good person that comes through in the book. Um, your spirit is in this book, and it's it's a wonderful read because it's there's justified anger in here, but also a gentleness. You take your reader into the subject with sympathy for our blindness, if I could put it that way. You're mm. a kind person, and I want to thank you for having written a terrific book, Keith. Thank you. This is really an important book. So I hope we'll come back when we do our book club and talk with us. And listen, it's an honor to be interviewing you on the day of a publication of a really important book. Um, so thank you for coming on on the on the day itself, and um, you know, Godspeed for the book, for you, for for your future. I just love this project. Thank you so much. Thank you, Frank. I appreciate it. Yeah, me too. Thanks. We'll talk again. All right. Bye. Bye-bye.